I specialize in the field of taking care of kids with refractory epilepsy. That's epilepsy not controlled by drugs. These kids are having multiple seizures per day. And I'll get right off and show you one example. So this is William. William began seizing about um, a, a right after birth, a few days afterwards. And when he came to us at 10 to 11 months of age, he was averaging anywhere from 30 to 50 of these a day. And if you look, he's just staring off. And that's a seizure that he just had when we captured on video EEG. Now by EEG, it looks something like this. And for those that can read close enough, the top set of rows is an actual seizure that's occurring from the right side of his brain. Now by imaging, he'd been born with a problem in the brain development that affected that entire hemisphere on that side. Now if we'd let these seizures go, and think about this, a seizure is an activity that takes over your whole brain. It hijacks it. And during the period of the seizure and afterwards, your brain has to re-scramble itself. And like your computer, often has to shut down and reboot. It often takes you several minutes to hours afterwards in order to recover. Now imagine that if you're doing this 30 or 40 times a day, there never is a stage in your, where your brain's got an opportunity to function normally. And because of that repeated seizure activity, these kids can't develop normally. Their brain gets scrambled. How scrambled? In a kid like William, if he's having seizures this many times a day by age one year, if he doesn't get the seizure stopped, he's heading to an IQ score of less than 50. What's that mean? He can't recognize mom and dad, aunt and uncle. He can't dress himself, not likely to talk, not likely to be able to involve in any of the social activities, can't eat with a spoon or a fork, a really debilitated individual. So we do something rather radical. We take out the bad part of his brain, which in this case is the half of his brain. And at surgery, we go in and uh, we do this little thing, and you can see some pictures here. This is the grossest you'll see. But this is an example of taking out. And the MRI beforehand looks like this. And afterwards, we've taken out half of that brain. What you see left over is disconnected. So we stop William's seizures. What happens to this young man? Here's a young man who at 11 months of age when we started was still acting like a five or six month old. Has a little bit of head control, isn't walking, isn't crawling, isn't doing any of the activities that you'd expect of that age. We stopped his seizures and what does he do? Through the miracle of digital photography and compulsive parents, <laughs> you're gonna see four years of development right now. Do you want to show them your teeth? How you doing? Can you say hello? Yeah, you smiling? We call this a combat crawl. Yeah! That's a butt crawl. Good walking on your knees. You're doing a good job. Oh, Stairs. This young man with his seizures controlled took off. And what's his developmental level today? Let's look. Is it the first day? Yep. Of what? Of school. Of school. Are you going to kindergarten? Mm-hmm. And how old are you? Five. Awesome. That sounds like a good day. Can I have a thumbs up? Okay, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12. Yep, that's what I count. I can eight, make a coat with this. Can you write the number 15? Okay, so 15? 15. Okay, one and five. Yes. 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 This is using his paretic side. 
So what you just witnessed? You witnessed some pretty miraculous recovery and growth. William never knew what life was like with both sides of his brain. He grew up with just one side of his brain. And with that growth, what he was able to do was to use many of the uh, functions and transfer. So that remaining left side took over for many of the things. He developed language, and with that language, he was able to read, write, and pretty much have all the personality that William has. But you also notice that there's a few things that don't transfer completely over. One would be vision. We didn't, if we were able to really get up close, things that would come into his left side of both of his eyes, he'd have trouble seeing until he got to the center. But he maintains his central vision, the color vision, and depth of field, so he's able to read and do those activities. The other things that he's obviously having trouble with is some of his motor function. He has strength in his proximal muscles compared to his distal. And with your leg, that's good. We don't hang from trees anymore. So he's able to go out and run and walk and do all those activities. He's able to lift his arm and move it. But he has trouble with that hand. So he has less plasticity there. So some functions are easily movable and can be taken over by the other side. And some are a little bit more of a struggle. Now let's take case two. This is Rachel. She started having seizures a little over age two and came to us about the age of five. And this is what one of her seizures looked like. On the playground. That's a seizure. Just fell to the ground. And when she had one of these seizures, it would take her hours to recover. Same sort of problem, did her surgery, and this is her six months out from surgery. She has a personality. Can you write me your name? Okay. And this is her walking without her brace. Now, she looks about the same as William. Is there really that much of a difference? Remember, I said William began life never knowing what the other side, that having two hemispheres. Rachel started life with two sides and then, because of the problem, had to have surgery. There is some subtle differences. In, in this case, if you look at the motor function of the hand between the two children in this video, he can use that hand as a helper hand. And you can see he can use it independently. Rachel, here trying to pop these bubbles, has more difficult time moving that paretic side and uses her good hand to actually help move it. So there's a subtle difference here. And if you watch them walking in this next set of videos, he walks straighter, a little more balanced, whereas Rachel has a little more of a hip subluxation, so there's a subtle bit of difference. Why is there this difference? Well, it turns out that in your brain, there's this thing called the motor sensory cortex, the motor sides in front of the sensory side, and the connections that go from there down to your spinal cord go down through these little tracks, and then in the brain stem, in the adult, which is us, the tracks shift so that 90% go to the other side. That's why the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. When you're first born, these tracks are actually equal so that one goes down and crosses and the other goes down on the same side. We call it the ipsilateral sp cortical spinal tract. If you zap the brain of a newborn, you get both sides to jump. By about age three, when you zap, only one side jumps. So there's a developmental change over time. In William's case, he was able to hopefully preserve part of that ipsilateral cortical spinal tract and thus had slightly better function because that tract doesn't go quite out to the fingers as well. Where in Rachel's case, it was already partly developmentally gone by the time that she had her surgery. So there are subtle differences as to the amount of plasticity based upon how the brain is organized. Now, how late can you go on this? And for that, I bring up Emily's story. Emily was a young girl who had uh, was a beautiful life. In fact, you can see her in videos from her home. Hi. Hi. She had both hands, able to play piano, and she was an avid soccer player. She developed something that is fairly rare and fairly devastating. It's a syndrome called Rasmussen encephalitis. This is an inflammatory process that affects only one side of your brain, 
and in so doing, it slowly destroys that brain. This is her MRI, and what we call a PET scan. And what you can see is on the right side of her brain, she had this progressive process that was destroying it. In the process of destroying it, she was getting subclinical seizures and a motor tension. When she came to us at the age of 13, this is what she looked like, and she'd been in a wheelchair for two years from this disease process. The disease led to such chronic muscle tension that she had actually subluxed her shoulder and her hip, and she was basically wheelchair bound for all of her activities. 13 years of age, how much neuroplasticity does she, can she have? The next video I'm going to show you will first show a segment of her six months out when she was still needing the wheelchair for some of her functions, and then you'll see what she's like two years from surgery. So she's able to get up, but she is struggling. 18 months later, though. Get going in your mom. However, she wants to do it. Okay. Right. Don't take pictures of my butt. Don't take a picture of my butt. Vanity always wins. She is walking. She is walking without the wheelchair. That's what we were working on. School? Inequalities and in graphing. Fun stuff. <laughs> Are you recording now? Yeah. So even two years out, she was able to show some dramatic improvement in her abilities. Now, we don't know what this is necessarily from. Was she able to recruit new pathways and some sort of neuroplasticity that took longer than what we saw in the younger kids? It's unclear, but you can see that even in this age, she was able to do dramatic improvements. Now, the next one is a little tougher. Clayton also had Rasmussen's encephalitis, only in this case, it affected the left side of his brain, the side of his brain that usually you control with language. Now, tradition holds that by five or six years of age, trying to move language from the left to the right side is very difficult. And in his case, he was getting to us by age 10. Now, this is what Clayton was like what when do you a young want man. For what do you want? Normal kid. And this is what he was like when he came to us. Now notice his right side. He's weak. And this is him trying to talk. I'm gonna have to learn to walk again. And uh, uh, and he, too, was suffering multiple seizures per day, in this case, affecting the right side of his body from this Rasmussen encephalitis. This is a really bad disease. You don't want to wish this on anybody. His MRI also showed atrophy on that side, but more importantly, doing a functional MRI to test for language showed that he had his receptive areas, which we call Wernicke's area the, on the right side of the screen, and expressive areas, we call Broca's, we're still on the left. The brain will keep language on the left for as long as possible. His seizures were going bad. His language was going bad. We took out that hemisphere. What was going to happen to his language? Here is Clayton two years out from his surgery. Hi, my name is Clayton Nelson Ross. I want you to put those words on the correct color for me. So not only can he talk, though he's having trouble with it, He's able to understand, and while he struggles a little bit, he will get the correct names on those colors. He is learning. His right brain has taken over much of the language functions that his left side was doing up until age 10. So this plasticity can go quite long. Now, we were also interested, could you intervene? Could you change neuroplasticity? And, and some work that's been from our laboratories and others we started to take these kids many years out and said, can we improve some of their functions through intensive therapies? And in this case, this is gait therapy, where you support the child's weight and work on how they move their foot. Now, this is day one. You'll see day three. And as we get to day five, some music's going to interject, because like you and I, when we exercise, if, it's, if you don't have any sound, it doesn't help. 
So these kids, while they're doing their exercise, they have, the, they have their audios on. Just keep your head in the game And don't be afraid to shoot the outside, Jay Just keep your head in the game You gotta get your, get your head in the game We gotta get it, get it, get it, get it Head in the game You gotta get your, get your head in the game Don't you love it? This therapy goes on even off the treadmill, such that the kids, when they're going up and down stairs, all of their activities, it's an intensive effort to figure out, to work with them. And when you do this, you can show with before and after, there are changes in the gait. So not so stable here, slower walker, more wide step gait. And with the therapy, you can then, and this is intense over the course of a week or two, you can increase speed, increase stability, and they do better. Now, was that just exercise induced? Here we showed with functional MRI that pre and after training, we could show changes in the area of activation of the remaining hemisphere, especially in the motor sensory area, such that we were inducing plasticity with this therapy. These are kids years out and we're able to take, with their, with their strategies, able to get them to do things what they couldn't do, invoking plasticity. Now, what about the hand? On the hand, you do something called constraint therapy. You take the good hand and you put it in a splint so they can't use it. And then you use the weaker side and have them work and exercise with it. Now, what does that actually then do in uh, a functional perspective? Now, this is before therapy. And she's been told to put some sugar or whatever on this muffin to eat. She ignores her paretic side. With therapy, and having her use that hand, we'll go to the next piece here, you'll see her struggling here. And this is after therapy. And she will now use the paretic side. This helps in all sorts of functions because she can now use the paretic side to assist in the activities of daily living, etc. These are struggles but these kids are showing this plasticity more than what you could ever see. And this was also associated with changes in the functional MRI. What's the future of these kids? Well, I'll show you one of the kids who's several years out. She's driving. She's got a life and, and she's functioning quite well in her, in her activities. So you can do quite a bit. Now think about it. You know, what can you do with half a brain? It'd be tough to be a neurosurgeon. You've got to have two sides. But you could be a lawyer. <laughs> and I'm sure that if most of you have some other people that you work with that you think are probably functioning on half a brain now. <laughs> One of my other kids just graduated from high school and she was on the swim team and the track team. While she didn't win any races, she beat some of her male competitors. And if you happen to be up in Idaho, Watch out for this yellow bug. <laughs> so these kids have an amazing ability to do quite a bit. And it's through their perseverance and their core challenges and the help of their families that they're able to surmount the odds that they've been given and to do things with three of six cylinders that most of us with six cylinders don't use effectively. So what's the future? The honest truth is, as a doctor, if I had a, an ability to put myself out of business, I'd love it. I'd love, as a scientist, to develop treatments that would prevent the need for doing hemispherectomies. Rasmussen's would be a good, uh, good treatment if we could figure out how to do this. In those kids we can't, new therapies to help to increase these functions using the principles of neuroplasticities. What we learn in these kids with half a brain could be used in adults with strokes, other diseases that affect the brain. This is an opportunity to learn, and these kids are a great way to do this. And then the dream. Wouldn't it be wonderful when I had to take out half of a bad brain if I could sprinkle in some cells and grow a new one? Having the good brain then work with the growing brain to become a whole brain. That would be fabulous. Now I have a number of people to thank. The production teams that obviously helped, the families with the videos, uh, the rehab teams. And this was partly funded through the National Institutes of Health. The national government wants to know where your money's spent. This is where part of it goes. And if you wanted more information, I have some information up here. And then one last note from the families you just heard from. Thank you. For listening to my story. Thank you.